Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Nice to have you back here. My name is Lee Fuman. I'm director of the University of Texas Marine Science Institute, and welcome to another episode of our public lecture series. How many people are here for the first time? Marvelous. It's very uh, common, as the rest of you know, that uh, about 30 to 40 or 50 percent of our audience every week is new, and I love that. But I also love the fact that more than 50 percent of the audience every week has been here week after week, and sometimes year after year. We're in our 11th year now. How many people have been coming all 11 years? <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all very much. It means a lot to us. We wouldn't do this if you didn't show up. <laughs> and since you do show up, we keep doing it, and that's why we've been doing this for 11 years. For those of you who are new, the uh, public lecture series that we hold every year in January, February, and March is uh, designed uh, with two purposes in mind. One is to educate the public about marine science, and the other is to, quite frankly, showcase our own researchers. Now, we will often, uh, most of the time, we'll pr have uh, presenters giving a talk on a particular topic of their own research, usually from our own institute. <coughs> we will, every year, pull in one or two people from outside the Marine Science Institute in the local area in the, in the marine science community to talk about their research as well. Uh, and as you can tell, it's pretty popular since you guys keep coming back. Um, we noticed uh, this, by the way, this series was developed by Linda Fuman, no relation. <laughs> uh, developed many years ago, uh, and uh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Sorry, it's a mental pause. Um, what, what, what was I going to say, Linda? Oh, yes, I, I, thank you for reminding me. Uh, over the years, we recognized that the question and answer period at the end of the uh, uh, lectures was growing uh, more and more interesting. The audience was more and more engaged, asking more and more interesting questions. And we thought to ourselves, wouldn't it be marvelous if we just had one night where all they got to do was ask questions of scientists? And so that's what tonight is about. I think we started this one about four years ago, uh, where we do these Ask a Scientist nights where we have a panel discussion. And uh, we thought, well, we could put, our, put ourselves in a very bad light if we had questions and answers on topics that we didn't have people that were, had the right expertise to respond to. So we decided the best thing to do is to have a theme for the evening. So our first theme was on global climate change. We had another theme on uh, overfishing or sustainable fisheries. And we did one on hypoxia or the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And tonight we're doing one on the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Uh, so that, that way we kind of uh, guide the topic, and that enables us to choose a panel of scientists who have the potential to answer the questions that you can come up with. And then to, to try to make it a little bit better for us, more in favor of us, sort of put the odds on our side, is we sort of show you, the, the way the evening will progress is we will show you video or audio clips on a particular topic within the larger theme, for about five minutes or so, or maybe less, and then we'll pause and we'll have questions about that topic, and then we'll move on to another video or audio or something like that, and then more questions, and we'll alternate between these two so that you have a chance to think about questions that will be of interest to you. So that's kind of the way the, the, uh, the program will go tonight, uh, but before we get into that program, uh, we do have an announcement that I wanna, uh, want you to hear, because I know many of you are around Port Aransas uh, looking for things to do to occupy your time. And so I've asked our volunteer coordinator, Colleen McHugh, to come talk to you. So I have a little self-run uh, presentation here just describing some of the different volunteer opportunities that we have at UTMSI. And uh, this one's coming up real soon, uh, this weekend. We've got it tomorrow and Saturday. Uh, we're getting ready for the Whooping Crane Festival, that we're gonna be doing tours over at the Wetland Education Center at 11 and three, I believe are the times, Friday and Saturday. And then we're displaying artwork in our visitor center here and uh, working a table over at the Civic Center. Um, we're doing educational trips on the RV Katie. School groups come out, um, all different age ranges, and take a half day trip out on the Katie. And we're looking for volunteers to help crowd control and kind of keep the students uh, honed in on the activities that they're doing out on the Katie. Um, we also have data entry if you guys are fond of computers. Uh, we have some handwritten data sheets that we need entered into Excel files. 
Um, our Wetlands Education Center, just outside here, there's tours every Tuesday and Thursday at 10 a.m. And we're looking for docents who would like to guide those tours. Um, in the wintertime, there's a lot of people down here that are available to do that. But in the summertime, our volunteers' numbers shrink. And so if you're a resident, that's a really good opportunity. Our brand new Bay Education Center, uh, we're looking for docents to help greet and um, kind of help explain some of the brand new exhibits there. And it also is the home of Science on a Sphere, which if you haven't seen it yet, it's an amazing new educational technology and pretty fun to participate in. And then here at the Visitor Center, we have aquaria that um, always need to be cleaned and fed. And so if you like uh, aquaria and find that a nice hobby, you're welcome to help us here. Um, also with movie afternoons, uh, they're always looking for somebody to help run the projector and kind of be a host of movie uh, afternoons here. The Animal Rehabilitation Keep um, is always looking for volunteers to help clean and feed the sea turtles and birds that are housed there. Um, because of the cold stuns in the season, uh, I know that they're overwhelmed with turtles right now. So if you find that interesting and can devote a month or two of service, uh, I can get you in there. Um, and then I'm starting some brand new citizen science projects. And right now they're all um, in the works. And one of them was to work with data from Tony Amos and record some of that. Right now we're just at kind of a data entry stage. The project is still uh, transforming. But um, if you're interested in doing citizen science, you can contact me and we can talk a little bit more about what's going to happen with that. So I appreciate all of you listening and hope maybe some of you will uh, give me a call or email me and otherwise enjoy the presentation and the lecture. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that uh, commercial for the Marine Science Institute. It's a great place to work. Uh, and then also to get some things out of the way before the end because I know you're all gonna be disbanding at the end of this. Uh, we're pretty, pretty much down the list of uh, presentations. If you're interested in knowing what's going on next week, Donna Shaver from the National Seashore is going to be talking about nesting by the endangered Kemp's Ridley, Ridley sea turtle here in Texas. She's been involved in this uh, head starting program and nesting on uh, Padre Island of Kemp's Ridley turtles for a couple of decades now. And it's, she's gave us a marvelous talk a couple of years ago, and I'm looking forward to hearing from her again. Okay, let me uh, introduce to you the panel of scientists that we have with us today to help answer your questions. I'll start with our guest. On the far right-hand side is Dr. Terry Quinn. Terry is the uh, director of the University of Texas uh, at Austin Institute for Geophysics, and his specialty is on the historical sediments of uh, the Gulf of Mexico. He's a geologist in the Jackson School of Geosciences. Next to him is Dr. Dong Ha Min, is an assistant professor here at the UT Marine Science Institute. Dr. Min is a, a physical oceanographer and is involved in uh, water movements uh, all over the world, actually. Uh, uh, next to him is Dr. Tracy Villarreal. Tracy is uh, also a professor here at the uh, Marine Science Institute. His expert expertise is in phytoplankton ecology. Uh, Tracy has uh, some uh, firsthand experience with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in as much as during the month of August, I believe it was. Tracy was on a cruise, uh, one, of the, one of the big research cruises trying to map the distribution of the, of the oil in the Gulf of Mexico. Is that right? Okay. It's amazing what I can remember. Uh, next to him is Dr. Jean Fay Liu, also uh, at the University of Texas Marine Science Institute here. Uh, Jean Fay is a uh, geochemist, an organic geochemist. And he, we are, he also has firsthand experience with the Deepwater Horizon spill. He, in fact, received one of the very first grants uh, issued by the National Science Foundation to uh, uh, attend to the problem. Uh, he was actually on a cruise with Dr. Wayne Gardner of our uh, staff in early May, just a few weeks after the oil spill started, and uh, was collecting uh, samples. And while on board the ship, got word from the National Science Foundation that he was going to receive that grant. So he really is one of the very first people out there. And then finally, Dr. Peter Thomas has been uh, with the Marine Science Institute for oh, 25 years or more. Uh, Peter is a reproductive endocrinologist and has a very broad career. His, some of his expertise is in toxicology and the effects of environmental uh, pollutants or contaminants on, uh, on, on fish, fish populations and their reproduction. So I think you have a, a broad group of talent here to address, hopefully, the questions that you come up with. 
And so what I want to start out with uh, tonight is something that we start out with every night uh, in our public lecture, lecture series, and that's uh, an episode of Science in the Sea, which is the Marine Science Institute's uh, radio program that airs on about 180 radio stations around the country. And uh, rather than show you this week's episode of Science in the Sea, we've picked one that's specifically on the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, and in particular on uh, the work of Dr. Liu. Exploring Science in the Sea. By the time engineers capped the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in July of 2010, it had gushed almost 5 million barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. Some of the effects were obvious, but others were less obvious. Finding and studying them required a quick response. Within weeks of the spill, for example, a research team discovered a plume of oil beneath the surface that was 10 miles long and hundreds of feet thick. Later, another team found that a patch of coral a few miles from the well was dead or dying. And a research cruise by scientists from the University of Texas and Michigan State University found that surface conditions changed rapidly once the well was capped, thanks to the work of tiny bacteria. The researchers sampled surface water at several spots off Louisiana in May and again in August. In some spots, oil was visible, but in others, it was not. Laboratory analyses showed that levels of alkanes, chemical components of the spilled oil, were 10 times higher in May than in August, even where no oil was visible. At one spot where there was oil in May, the water also contained unusually high levels of amino acids. Since fast-growing bacteria can release those chemicals, the analyses indicated that bacteria played an important role in the quick disappearance of alkanes after the well was capped. One concern, though, is that the fast-growing bacteria might remove oxygen from the water and kill the animals that live there. It's complicated. This episode of Science in the Sea was made possible by a grant from the National Science Foundation. For the University of Texas Marine Science Institute at Port Aransas, I'm Holly Brawley. So that, that audio clip started out by sort of laying out the brief history of the, of the uh, spill occurring in April and, uh, and what might have happened very soon afterward. And it talked about the topic of uh, the natural or maybe not so natural decomposition of the oil, the fate of the oil and so forth. So this is kind of the, the uh, subject matter that I'm hoping the first set of questions might be on. What things are you interested in with regard to what happened to the oil? And for this, of course, we are recording these uh, programs on video and audio for replay in the Bay Education Center in Rockport. And so when you ask a question, I will repeat the question because I have the microphone. <laughs> and don't worry, if it's a dumb question, we'll edit it out. <laughs> Maybe not. Yes, sir, in the back. So the question uh, recognizes that the, the dispersants were, uh, were placed in the, into the water at the wellhead uh, pretty quickly. Uh, how much dispersant was used? Um, what was the next part? How toxic. How toxic is the dispersant, and is there any left now? Right? Anybody want to answer that, or try? So you can see uh, that's 185 million gallons of crude oil was released. Certainly, that number still have some debate. BP certainly the ones. Oh, we don't. We didn't release that much amount of oil, and uh, you know. That's actually pretty consistent with a lot of independent scientists estimate. So that's the, the amount of oil released. The, the dispersant that you're asking is about 1.7 million gallons. So the ratio, the theoretical ratio is, is that you have 100 gallons of oil, you need a one gallon of dispersant to totally kind of disperse the oil. That's the theoretical value. That's actually approximately what they used. So the second question, whether uh, you know, the, this burden, the, uh, whether it's still there or not, there's actually indeed a paper just came out from Environmental Science and Technology last month. They're saying the this burden is still there. So they are really, so while, while the, let me go to another slide to give you an idea what the this burden looks like. So let's go to the slide 26. All right, so as you can see, uh, 
the disburden that there, I just list a couple major components, uh, including uh, several uh, compound prop propylene glycol, and the second one is the two uh, two butoxy ethanol. They people think this one is toxic, and uh, then the major one is the uh, we call the DOSS. It's actually the octo sodium sulfur sulfonate. It's a kind of like a, a component of detergent. So that paper I just mentioned uh, in uh, environmental science technology actually measured this DOSS in the deep water. They found they were very conservative. Their conclusion is that uh, the degradation of this compound in the deep ocean is very, very low. So it's still out there. So certainly, okay, so how toxic? I mean, I would give it a well, it's a good question. Um, the first compound was <coughs> called 9527, and that's the one that had the, um, quite a lot of the 2-butoxyethanol. And um, that one is, that is fairly toxic. So EPA um, got BP to stop using that, and they started using another variation, 9500, the same company, which didn't have that ingredient, which is less toxic. But um, this, um, the one that was used first is not, has been banned for use in the UK for cleaning up shores. So it, it, it was one of the more toxic um, um, dispersants available. So um, uh, there's been a lot of question why they didn't use less toxic um, dispersants. The question recognizes that in addition to oil, there's gas, uh, there was gas released at the spill, and what is the, how much of an, and what is the relation of that to the oil? Is that correct, Bill? Somebody want to tackle that one? I can say something about the fate of the gas, especially methane. Uh, <clears throat> Gulf of Mexico is a well known place as a natural hydrocarbon seep, which means even in a natural condition, tremendous amount of hydrocarbon gas, including methane is bubbling up through the entire water column of Gulf of Mexico. That's, that's a normal condition. I have a, a number that the recent estimate in the Gulf of Mexico at a natural condition, 140,000 tons of hydrocarbons are entering into the Gulf of Mexico each year. That's in a natural condition. What happens to most of the, the gas compounds, methane, is because it's a gas, it bubbles up, as, as you may have experienced in your bathtub, it rises up. <laughs> and fortunately for the people on the land, most of the methane actually dissolved back to the water before it actually escaped to the atmosphere. That's a natural condition. But the problem is something like a catastrophic event like uh, this oil spill, that there's tremendous amount of gas and oil pouring into the, in the water column in a very short period of time, then there is a lar the larger chance that some would escape to the atmosphere or some would disperse along a larger distance. But according to the recent study, the, most of the methane emitted from the oil spill itself seem to be pretty much gone. So what we are, the scientists working on this problem is trying to trace the dispersion pattern of the residues of oils and dispersants, not necessarily the gases themselves, because it's really difficult to track them down for the longer period of time for the long the distance. The question is, the question is, what is the proportion of the entire spill that is gas as opposed to oil and other substances? Is that correct, Bill? What's the relative importance? Relative importance of gas in the in the release. Anybody? Well, there have been um, there have been some estimates of that, and this particular oil seems to have had somewhere between 40 and 50 percent, approximately, of the total volume released due to methane. Um, probably low 40s to high 40s percent. But it was a huge quantity of the total release was due to the methane. 
So I guess a follow-up question is, now you know what the proportion was, <laughs> what is the importance of that proportion? So how important is it that 50% was gas versus, uh, versus oil? I mean, is gas more or less troublesome than oil? Well, well this, this is the, um, I'm sure BP would love, like to know this as well. This is a hugely important question because many of the hydrocarbons that are released in oil are, are not very uh, available to the biology. They take a long time to break down. Methane, however, is very, very active. And it's also a very powerful greenhouse gas. So the initial estimates um, that, that John Kessler at A&M up the road made was that this event, if it was not metabolized, would actually show as a measurable inc rate of increase, measurable blip on the total global rate of increase of methane in the atmosphere. And of course, as a powerful greenhouse gas, that has huge consequences. Um, it is biologically very active. And uh, the paper that Dong Ha was just mentioning uh, was John Kessler in Science a few weeks ago, where they calculated it was all gone, or most of it was gone. However, this is not going uncontested. There's a, a, a reply being reviewed right now saying, well, they didn't actually do everything quite right. And it, it kind of gets back to one of the basic problems that we had studying this, in that the, um, the ships and the people that get out there were, it took a while. And a lot of the really interesting things that happened, um, the fate, the dispersants, the biological activity, happened in that key window of about the first 45 to 50 days or so, when it was simply impossible for large teams of scientists to get out to study this in a comprehensive fashion. So what we're trying to do is piece together a record now based upon incomplete information with lots of errors associated with it to try to understand what happened to all this stuff. So you'll get, you'll get people disagreeing, but the fact it was methane, of course, um, directly gets to the, the oxygen drawdown in the Gulf, which was the very big problem that a lot of people were worried about. That was my next question. Is, is, there, is there a big oxygen deficit now there? Um, no, there isn't. Um, it, um, there was a localized drawdown at the depth of the plume that originally was visible, but not really a major. But the concern was that over time, as this uh, organic loading actually got into the system, that the bacteria would continue to draw the oxygen down. But that did not seem to happen. So in the, in the area of the plume, at about 1,400 meters, you could actually see oxygen being uh, drawn down. Lee, if you could put up slide num my slide number 11, number 12, I think that is. Now, this is actually a readout from the instrumentation on the ship that was taken from a continuous profiler that's lowered down in the water. It's called a CTD. And what you see here on the, um, the far left-hand axis, yeah, oh, good point. Here, this is depth. And across the top here, you have a couple different um, measurements. And these are all recorded electronically and sent up a conducting wire to the ship. And you can actually see them in real time. It's a very cool piece of equipment. Uh, what you see here in the green, this is a signature of the oil from its uh, fluorescence. It's illuminated with ultraviolet radiation by this uh, sensor, and then it emits a, a longer wavelength light. It's in the, the uh, very close to the blue, and it actually can be measured. So what you see here at the surface is there's not much. You're going down, 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 down. And starting at about 1,000 meters or so, about a kilometer down, you start seeing this big increase here and then a decrease. Well, this was the depth of the plume from the um, deep water horizon. And this, this was about, um, oh, probably 150 kilometers downstream of the wellhead itself. But what I wanted to call your attention to is this in the blue, well, magenta. This is the oxygen profile. So you have lots of oxygen at the surface. It decreases with depth. This is a very common feature in the Gulf of Mexico over broad areas. So it's just called the subsurface oxygen minimum increases with depth, and normally it keeps increasing down to the bottom. But here you see the oxygen was being drawn down. This is what was called the oxygen sag, and it exactly um, paralleled the increase in fluorescence due to the oil. So this is an example of the type of drawdown that people were concerned about, and the worry was that in this plume here, this oxygen would go down to very close to zero. But for uh, a number of reasons that are still not very well understood, it did not do that. So uh, the Gulf dodged a real bullet.
Tony? Yes. Um, how, um, how, much is, uh, how much is a gallon of correct it, and how do they get it down to the fluid? How, how is that done? I mean, I, you probably don't know how much it, it is a gallon, but I'm sure it's pretty expensive stuff. Right, can you bring my slide uh, number 20? Which one? Uh, my slide number 20. Number 20. Uh, let me repeat the question, and that was uh, how much is a gallon of Corexit, <laughs> and how did they get it down to the, uh, to the plume? Well, you know, the short answer, I don't know exactly how, how, how did they do it. But I do have this uh, slide that can, uh, can kind of help, help you understand a little bit. So here they have, you know, what you see here, here is the wellhead, and this is the process of the oil released from the well. But this is like a theory. When you don't have the, this burden to use, that's what you see. All the oil, because of the density, the lighter density, they will rise up to the surface. So here is the theory. When they, you put a lot of this burden, and then the oil Try, try to dissolve in the water. So you, the oil and the water is mixed much better when you have the dispersant. And this is what really happened, they think, what really happened uh, in, the, in the deep water horizon oil spill where they put a lot of dispersant right on the oil head here. And they would put it here because they have a lot of pressure, the fluid is coming out, and then they got mixed with the dispersant. And they certainly you have a big fraction dissolved in the water, and then you still have a small fraction or riding to the surf sea surface. So how exactly do it? They must uh, send, send down a pump or something and uh, right on, the, on here on the wellhead and the, based on the pressure release they mix. So the question is what, what is the fate of the oil? So you, the gentleman suggests that uh, it uh, uh, turns to gas and then yeah. goes up to the surface and down to the bottom. We actually have people that, that studied that. In fact, part of the uh, Part of the uh, audio presentation that we made was Dr. Liu's work that looks a little bit into the, the, the fate of the oil. So, Jean Fay, would you like to mention something? Well, I mean, you, you can see here when they, uh, the oil was released here and you put a lot of dispersant, and the oil will still, a fraction will rise. So, the fate, the gas, I mean, I think Tracy uh, kind of addressed the, the fate of the methane of the gas. And then <coughs> you think about this, this kind of water column called the water column is uh, 1,500 meters deep. So when, the, when they, uh, the oil was released here and then when they come up, during this process, the oil actually kind of fractioned, fractioned because you, know, the, you can imagine uh, because of the petroleum or the crude oil, it, it's a huge mixture of hundreds of thousands of compounds. So uh, some fraction will be a little bit heavier. They will stay, stay in the uh, certain layer. That's, uh, what Tracy showed, uh, the slide you can see there, a layer of oil plume, they, what you probably found in the media, they, they, they reported their deep water oil plume. That's actually the heavy fraction. And then when you continue to rise, so there the, a fraction of the oil will go to the sea surface, which is the, light, the lightest oil component or you know, the last dense one, they will go to the sea surface and, and go with the wave and they will hit the salt marsh. That's kind of the kind of left over you see on the, on the shoreline after this whole fractionation process. I actually have some data to uh, kind of follow up this fate. Uh, if you uh, bring the, uh, the 28, the slide of 28. So here, here uh, show you some data of the uh, N-alkane, we call it. It's one uh, major component of the petroleum. So it's basically the hydrocarbon. You have the carbon and the hydrogen atom. So uh, the C number here, which means C18, for example, is 18 carbon number. So we have the C series of compound. So it's from go smaller molecule to big molecule. So the point I want to show you here, here you see the, here is the oil collected from the wellhead. It's original oil. So you can see a lot of lighter stuff. It's dominated by C10 to C17 or so. So this, the bottom, bottom figure is the oil we analyzed in my lab to look at the marsh. So here is the oil we collected on the soft marsh, uh, which is located in the coast of Mississippi. So you can see the oil already changed. So they they're tend to be heavy, more enriched. 
So the, the whole point of the, the, a lot of fraction, fractionation going on uh, due to this oil spill because you're talking about 1,500 meters deep. So this is what we see from huge difference from the oil head, from the well head, and the, from what we see on the shoreline. I'll take one more question before we go to the next one. Uh, the question is recognizing that even now there's still oil near the bottom, and, and, and it, which may have been, a, or seems to be a surprise, there's still some uh, uh, corrects it out there, some dispersant out there. And is there a plan to deal with this? And uh, yeah, anybody, can anybody handle that? Let me just talk first about uh, the potential coordination. Um, what I can say, I was actually involved in a little bit from early on, and there was a tremendous amount of uh, uh, effort to get things coordinated right right after the spill. There was a large meeting at EPA where people from NOAA, the USGS, and from private industry, and uh, you know, BP basically was running a 24-7 uh, a operation in Houston uh, that had uh, engineers from all of the companies uh, uh, in the world there uh, working on this problem. So it wasn't for the lack of trying. Uh, nor the, anytime you deal with uh, multi-government agencies uh, which have uh, different jurisdictions relative to where the oil is and where it goes, those are two different things, uh, run by two different organizations of the government, uh, things got a little bit complicated. Uh, and so I think we could learn a lot to improve that. Uh, but there was a, a, a tremendous effort to call in all the best minds in the world from all over the world uh, to work both with uh, Secretary Chu, had, had, had a, uh, the Energy Secretary had a special commission on the, on the Gulf, which brought the, uh, the best and brightest engineers and scientists in on this. Uh, so um, they are working now sort of in a, a post-mortem way to say, how can we get better at it? Uh, so I think that uh, we will get better at it, uh, but it wasn't for the lack of trying, and it was a lot of people working uh, very hard to, to try to coordinate their efforts on this. Um, I actually have a picture that uh, Mandy Joy took on the, one of the ships that we were on this past summer. It's a slide number 16 to give you a sense of what this actually looks like on the bottom. Yeah, the, on the slide in the upper right, you see about a two-inch thick layer of kind of a flocculent-looking muck. That, that's oil which has kind of fallen out of the solution. It's uh, coagulated around particulates, transformed, and then settled out. Um, there, there is um, an aspect of this which has been widely um, underreported in the media, and it gets back to the, the fates of this material and why it, has been, why it has been so difficult to understand where it is and what it's doing. Uh, so, Lee, if you could go to slide number two. Let's start with slide number two. This is what the media portrays, okay? You have the gusher down at, oh, I think they're calling it about 5,000 feet or so. Big, nasty plume of oil comes up. It sits on the surface because, right, oil floats. That's what it does. And then um, all these charismatic macrofauna get stuck in it and porpoises and birds. And, and of course, that did happen to some extent, and it was uh, most unfortunate for the ecosystem. And then it would kind of get into the salt marshes and cause problems. That's the, the view. This is actually from Environmental Defense, their newsletter. Um, Lee, if you could go forward to slide number four. What wasn't widely reported, was that, oops, one back, please, is that about, uh, what was it, seven to 10 years ago, there actually was a directed experiment to what would happen if you had a blowout in the deep sea. This is called Project Deep Spill. It was funded by the oil companies. I think it was conducted off the coast of Norway. And they actually um, conducted uh, what, an experiment. They mimicked it. They pumped oil under high pressure, raw crude oil, and released it in a plume at 800 meters to see what would happen. So it was not an exact parallel of deep water horizon. It gives us about half the depth and half the pressure, and nowhere near the, uh, the reservoir pressure coming out. But it, it was a mimic. And it gave a very good idea and probably a pretty reasonable approximation of a lot of what we saw happen in the deep water horizon. Um, some of the key points um, I extracted from this reporter up at the top. And one of them is that the surface slicks may account for as little as 2% of the total oil released. 2%. Okay. 
Now, if we assume uh, maybe that was a mistake, maybe 10%. Well, we had about 4 million barrels of oil release, which meant only maybe, maybe about 400,000 barrels actually made it to the surface. The rest, as you see, um, actually gets shot up into the water, and because of the pressure of the water and, uh, and the pressure the oil is coming out of and the dissolved gases, it actually very quickly breaks up into almost neutrally buoyant particles. Adding dispersants probably enhanced this considerably. Uh, we don't know to what degree. And then this stuff starts going laterally with whatever the currents are doing at that depth. And the deep water horizon is about three kilometers a day, but there's tidal things sloshing back and forth. So it was a very non-homogeneous mixture. Then it starts precipitate, coagulating, and settling out. So you had big blobs of it going up, clumping up, settling out, and then vast amounts of it, unknown amounts, one, uh, being advected down current. So when you're asking, you know, well, what is the government doing about it? It's a huge effort just to find out where it went. Um, it, it's an enormous problem out there. When I was out there in August, the plume was known to be about 300 kilometers long, at least. And they're still trying to find the downstream end of it and find out what the lateral extent of it was. So it's an immensely challenging problem to try to um, even map where it is in the ocean because of its sub majority subsurface nature. You simply can't see it. And ships are slow, and they're very expensive, and have very limited sampling capabilities um, for looking at things on this spatial scale. Thank you. Let's move on to another topic now. What I want to do now is show you a little video that kind of lay out, lays out the thinking of scientists early in the process. Uh, you know, more or less scientists that are brainstorming about what needs to be done. Recognize that when this event happens, or any giant catastrophe like this happens that we're not prepared to deal with, which by definition is a catastrophe, there are lots of things involved. For instance, the engineering. How do you stop the thing? That's an engineering question, not so much a science question, although science bears on that. There's also the issue of uh, what's going to happen to all the oil, which we've just spent a lot of time talking about. But there's also the, the issue that we all think about, and that's what's the impact? How is this going to affect our environment? And I think a lot of that is covered in, uh, in this next video. There's a great deal of new things to be learned from this oil spill that we did not learn from the Exxon Valdez spill or from the other oil spills we've studied. And the main reason is that this spill is unique in a number of ways. major scientific question is what is the uh, long-term impact of, of this oil spill to the environment? Uh, but to understand, again, the long-term impact, you have to, to uh, understand and quantify the near-term impact and, and uh, the what happened to the oil. Uh, but the major scientific question is still ahead of us trying to find out how um, both the oil and the dispersant have been incorporated in the system through the food chain and, and his, how it's going to be, what is the residence time of the oil and oil product in the environment. I'm interested in two things particularly. What is the effect on the coastal waters, the food webs that are there, the uh, recruitment, which is the spawning of, of uh, important species, both forage species that uh, commercial fish eat and, and the commercial fisheries that we have, uh, oysters, shrimp, various uh, uh, fin fish, etc. So I'm interested in that as a very important aspect of this. And then the other thing is what's happening in the wetlands and marshes. Uh, is the oil having a lasting effect? Is it causing an already bad situation to get worse? We've studied a lot of other oil spills in the past, and this one is different from those because the spill was a long way offshore. The oil was very diluted. It was very weathered by the time it got to the coast. There were lar very large amounts of oil and a lot of dispersants added. So there's a lot of new aspects to this spill that um, raise issues that we, uh, we haven't, don't, don't understand very well from previous oil spills. Before you can figure out what the effects of the oil are, you've got to know where it went. 
because obviously you're not going to, if you're uh, uh, an organism, you're not going to be affected by oil that doesn't get to you. So that's very critical. The biophysical modeling that I've developed in, in my lab um, has been very useful for uh, developing an oil model because the oil is not a water parcel. The oil and water do not mix so um, unless they're dispersed. So the fact that I, our team had developed the um, um, model for the larvae that have also a behavior, we could transfer that into uh, oil component and look at the oil behavior and put that in a Lagrangian framework. I think there needs to be a, an identifiable pool of money that would be available to bring the academic community into the process. Now you'd ask, well, if this happens, is that going to compromise the NERDA process, which is, a, which is an adversarial legalistic issue? And you've got the responsible party, BP, doing everything it can to protect its own interests and its shareholders. And you've got the U.S. government doing everything it can to protect the taxpayers and recover the damages. And will this independent uh, information somehow cause uh, that to be compromised? And say, allow BP to get off the, off the hook uh, because uh, it starts to make the federal information poor. My feeling is that good science is going to ultimately be the most important thing to both sides in the end. And uh, that with time, we'll get to the, the best answers we can. And that's what's going to have to be acceptable. Uh, but if you don't involve the academic community, then you've lost a huge amount of the of the intellectual and, and creative capacity of this nation. The point of that was to uh, try to convey to you the complexity of the issue, the thought that goes into what to do, recognizing that the populace is very excited and upset and wants an immediate solution, and it's impossible to have an immediate solution. But more than impossible to have an immediate solution, it may be extremely difficult to even have an impact. And so, you know, I, I wanted you to see the big picture from a scientist's point of view or from several scientists' point of view. And so I think now we could sort of try to entertain a, a discussion of approaches to dealing with impacts or approaches to measuring impacts or anything like that. We, we can move on to specific effects in, in a subsequent, uh, a subsequent uh, video that I have. So if there are any questions that come to mind. Yes, sir? So how do you prioritize the effects, or maybe also how do you prioritize your actions uh, in these issues? Uh, not sure whether we have panelists that can deal with that or not. Anybody? I can't answer the question, but I can try to uh, give some perspective. Um, what you're asking is actually not a science question. It's a policy um, politics decision. Science can provide information as to what might happen, what's likely to happen if you conduct a certain course of action. But the actual action chosen is, of course, conducted by you know, governors, heads of agencies, et cetera, who are having to respond to a lot of different uh, needs. So there is no good answer to that, because what is one person's optimal solution is not another person's optimal solution. So, so how did you get things done? Well, maybe you write a white paper. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of things has, has happened from this, and I think one of the things that uh, one of the speakers there, Chris Delia, was talking about, you know, logistically, it was uh, you know, just a, such a large and unprecedented event that you had to scramble so many things, so many assets to get there in such a short period of time. Now, in hindsight, we should have already had something, should, we should have expected to, at some time to have a problem like that because oil spills are, when you uh, explore for oil and gas in the, in the ocean, these things happen. It's not, it's not if, it's when. Um, and so, so the risk arbitrators do this all the time for, uh, for a living. And so one of the things that's happening post this now is several of the major companies, uh, Shell, uh, Exxon Mobil, and uh, Chevron and others, are, have put together a program that they're going to have their own sort of 
uh, 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 vessel and technology sort of ready to go at any one time. If you remember some of the problems that we had is that we had to take ships in from other parts of the world to get them in to come to the Gulf of Mexico, and that caused a, a large delay and caused some more problems. So one of the things we're, we're trying to do is to actually set up something, since the Gulf is uh, clearly a large uh, hydrocarbon province and important to the, actually the national security of, uh, of our country, that we actually have the assets in place to work on those things. And so hindsight's always 2020, and we're, and we're working on that, but there's a lot of resources and a lot of planning going on so as uh, this won't happen again in the terms of the, the response and the complicated response to that. So there are plans that are afoot to work on that. I'd like to jump in uh, to add a little bit to all of this. Of course, we are all scientists dealing at a much lower level than the people making the decisions on the priorities. And the people making the decisions on the priorities are all very, very highly, high level people that are appointed at presidential level and so forth. Those are the ones that were in charge of the whole operation and they had to do with economics and engineering and human impacts and health and, and environment and everything that you could possibly imagine. Down at, at my level, as director of a, a regional institute in marine science on the Gulf of Mexico, I, I can give you some insight to how we were involved at that kind of administrative level. So for instance, we here at the Marine Science Institute are the host institution for the Mission Aransas National Estuarine Research Reserve, which is a big mouthful for a state-federal partnership. So we're part of NOAA in that sense. And that NOAA operation, the NUR system, the reserve system, has 28 reserves around the coast of the United States, and several of them are in the northern and eastern Gulf of Mexico, impacted by the oil directly. And so as a member of that larger unit, every Wednesday morning I was on the phone with a, a conference call dealing with, with all the Gulf Coast reserves, whether they were impacted or not. We were not impacted at all. But we were listening to and, and learning from the experiences of our colleagues in Florida and Alabama and, and Louisiana and Mississippi uh, what was happening to them on the ground. Now, of course, for them, it was a nightmare. And they were having extremely long days for months on end. Uh, we, on the other hand, had an opportunity to learn what would happen, what we would have to do if it happens to us. We also got to see how decisions were being made on the ground. I mean, when, you know, emergency comes up and they had no idea what to do, this is what I had to do. This is what I did in my circumstance. And this is the, the fallout from what I did. You know, this is the public reaction or this is the environmental effect of what we did. Uh, so there was, you know, we were involved even though we were nowhere near it because of our relationship with the federal agency. And by the way, as a result of this experience, again, hindsight is 2020, and again, we learned from these things, we contributed, the Marine Science Institute and our Mission Aransas Reserve contributed to a proposed action plan for environmental crises such as this in the Gulf of Mexico so that if it happens again, we have a plan. And that plan is about to be approved, and we'll be part of it. So these things happen. It looks like we're not prepared for them. Of course, you can never be prepared for everything, but you learn from that experience and make it better next time. And will we be fully prepared next time? No, of course not. But we'll learn from that one and get better still. Yes, sir. Apparently, there were offers of assistance from overseas, and these were, were turned down. And uh, what was the second part of that? What impact did that have? What, what impact did that loss of assistance have on, on, the, on the cleanup, I guess? Or yes. Anybody? I'm the visitor. <laughs> so. And I'm not an attorney, but I stayed at the Holiday Inn Express last night. Um, uh, there were some legal issues involved uh, with that that made it uh, uh, cumbersome uh, and litigious uh, in nature to accept some of those uh, uh, ships from what I understand. Uh, but I can tell you um, almost every asset that you could bring to the problem was, was tried. And, uh, you know, so there was just, unfortunately, a lot of the assets were not local. So some of the ships that actually came were actually were collecting some of the oil eventually, you know, came from halfway around the world to get there. So even if, you, even if there wasn't a, a uh, political impediment, it still takes a long, long time to transit from the North Sea to the Gulf of Mexico. And so that gets back to a point I tried to make earlier on. I think we, we need to make sure that we have uh, assets uh, uh, in the Gulf that reside in the Gulf. Uh, so if these things happen again, we don't have to res uh, require a ship to come from the North Sea or the, 
of the Middle East to, to get here. I probably don't know enough about that to, to comment that. I'm more property off on my ledge, just on my U.S. comments. Okay. Can animals detect the oil and avoid it, or do they uh, just, are they resolved to swim into it and die? A lot of animals, of course, can detect it. Um, fish, for example, have very good sense of smell. They can detect it and they'll avoid it. Um, of course, small animals, like um, the very small animals living on the surface, the plankton and the larvae um, cannot um, escape from it because they're, they ha they're on the surface. So, so with regard to the, the oil that's on the surface, the, mo the greatest concern is, for example, for floating eggs and very young organisms that cannot escape from it. But large animals can certainly um, escape from it. And the consequences of that death of animals in the floating surface, the young stages, are, can be huge because those are the future generations. If you wipe out a whole right. year, you could have a tremendous impact on the population. Yeah, so the concern, for example, was with the bluefin tuna that's supposed to spawn just two places in the, in the world. In, the, um, in, in that area of the northern Gulf of Mexico and also in the Mediterranean, and that these stocks are are uh, considered by many to be endangered, so there's a lot of concern about particularly that um, group of fish because they were spawning around the time that their spill occurred and these oil slicks were found. Just on one thing, talking about um, the oil, there's parts of the oil that is soluble in water. These are those lighter fractions, and one of them is like mothballs, naphthalene, very toxic. So the thinking about where you put your effort, which is referring to an earlier question, you can think of it also from a biological standpoint. When you have an oil spill, the first thing that happens is those very light fractions cause immediate death. And in this case, there wasn't really much evidence of widespread fish kills anywhere because um, they, they were removed very quickly. It was very hot, so they quickly evaporated. So probably there wasn't that acute toxicity that you often see with a lot of uh, oil spills. But of course, the long-term effects is what most um, of us are concerned about from the chemical aspects of the oil spill. There's the chemical aspects of the oil spill and also the physical ones, the oiling on the surface. They're two quite different things. So the, the questioner recognized in the news last night that there were uh, there was de mass deaths of uh, young dolphins, and wondered whether that might have to do with the oil. Yeah, the, it's you know whenever something happens, you speculate that it's due to something like the oil spill. I mean, the problem is um, we don't know. You and one would have to analyze the carcasses to see whether they had significant amounts of oil, and we can talk about. Um, I thought this was going to be later tonight, but we can talk about the specific effects of, of oil, if you like, the long-term effects. Shall I put a but slide the, up? Um, so, yes, okay. Since it's come up, I yeah. guess. So, um, 32. So I was talking about those acute effects which kill the organisms very quickly, but we have long-term effects of oil, and this is some of the community effects of oils, petroleum, on all kinds of different organisms from plants to fish. And one of the big effects is reduced development and also impaired reproduction. So the development, we're talking about development of young, I um, mean, it could be that the oil exposure, it could be, we don't know, it could be that oil exposure has certainly been shown to affect reproduction and then subsequent development of young. And it causes things like, um, you can see all these things it causes down here, cancer, malformations. It also causes, um, it's also teratogens, which means it causes abnormal development, which would cause the fetus to be aborted. But I don't know the details of these um, young dolphins that are dead, and obviously they would do, need to be autopsied 
to get more information. Peter, I think Tony Amos has a response. Yes, um, every year, this time of year during the cupping season for dolphins, we get um, young neonate dolphins that wash up there on the beach. It right. could be as many as 10 or 12. Right. They were talking about 17 in the Mississippi and Alabama, I believe. So, although there may be a connection, as you point out, um, there is always a tendency, especially on the part, part of the media, to relate that and say that this must be and make a story of it that implies, even though they, they put Right. And just to make sure this gets onto the recording, because I'm not sure you, they, they, we picked you up, uh, if I remember correctly, Tony, you said that, uh, that the report was that there were 17 uh, deaths of young dolphins this year, and that every year you get about 10 or so uh, that normally occur. And so there's not necessarily a link to the oil. Okay, uh, just since we're on the topic of specific effects, I'll move to the next little video clip and we can continue this discussion. On April 20th, the Gulf of Mexico drilling rig Deepwater Horizon exploded, killing 11 workers. Two days later, it sank to the ocean floor, creating three major breaks in the connecting pipe. No one knows for certain how much oil is being released, but there is no disagreement that the spill is massive. Our experience with most spills is that they occur at the ocean's surface. This one, originating at the ocean floor and rising up through the water column, has the potential to affect the marine environment at every level. As the plume reaches the surface of the water, it begins to spread due to gravity and moves with the wind and currents. It forms an oil slick that's harmful to marine life. Responders use dispersant chemicals to break up the oil slick on the water's surface. They're also using these chemicals deep underwater on the Gulf floor, and the impacts are largely unknown. Plankton form the base of the marine food web and live in surface waters. Oil is often lethal to plankton because they move with the currents and have no ability to move away on their own. The coastal waters are home to many commercially important species, such as shrimp, oysters, and gag grouper. The oil can be toxic to fish larvae swimming to the surface. Shark species found in this part of the Gulf include scalloped hammerheads, big-eye thresher, and short-fin mako. Sharks can come into direct contact with chemicals in the oil, giving their flesh harmful levels of these toxins. Bluefin tuna spawn in the surface waters of the Gulf during the spring months, and their eggs can be damaged or killed from exposure to oil. Adult bluefin are also at risk from bioaccumulation of oil-based chemicals like dispersants. In the deep waters where light is scarce, cold water corals and a wide variety of microbes are vulnerable to oil contamination. One of the most extensive cold water coral sites rests just 25 miles north of the BP well site. As with any catastrophic spill, it's impossible to predict the extent of the damage, how much oil is being spilled, how long will it be before the spill is halted, how far will it spread. The Gulf's ecology and economy are both at risk. Okay, impacts on marine life. Questions? Yes, sir. Recognizing that the gas, gas releases are a major part of the spill, what are the effects of that and, and uh, tracking and measuring that? Anybody? I can start. As we mentioned earlier, the, at the moment it's very difficult to track the, the dispersion of gas itself at least in, your, in an adjacent area from the wellhead, but we are actively tracking down the dispersion of the microparticles of oil droplets with the dispersants in, in a subsurface layer, particularly it spreads, or we believe it's around 1,200 meters or so deep. It's pretty deep. It's slightly above the wellhead depth. And because deep ocean is very difficult to explore, it is very challenging, difficult to track down where this plume, deep water plume, may move or migrate in a stock. So it is an ongoing process of work. 
So the question is, how long will the scientists know, how long will it take for the scientists to determine the impact of the oil spill with a high degree of certainty? Yeah. If ever. <laughs> Three years, five days, and six hours. <laughs> Let me add a quick notion on it. I think that's the example of the low probability but high risk matter, like a nuclear power plant security type of thing. It's very difficult to predict what might happen and how we can assess the, the damage because it is very difficult to actually simulate the actual situation and assess the damage without really making things bad happen. So, but we, Scientists had done some back of the envelope calculations. Is, for example, after the Ixtoc blowout in 1979 in Gulf of Mexico, the people had some calculation. Okay, what if the oil spill in that magnitude happens? Uh, there was a, a dimension earlier about the oxygen deficit. Would be the dissolve, dissolve the oxygen in the Gulf of Mexico will be depleted in a, in a foreseeable future. What, what, how long or whether it's possible. The, because we know how much oxygen it may consume for, with the oil, at least in a laboratory condition, we can calculate how much oxygen it will remove solely from the oil reaction. So we, in our experiment, thought experiment, dump 200 million gallons of oil in the Gulf of Mexico. We know the oxygen inventory of Gulf of Mexico, and we know the rate of reaction. And the answer, so there's a good answer and bad answer. The good ans answer is there will be no catastrophic or significant impact on oxygen level of Gulf of Mexico in large, because the reaction rate is very, very slow and amount of oil spill is relatively smaller compared to the entire volume of Gulf of Mexico. However, the bad news is it depends. The, in terms of impact, people talk about how much oil is being spilled when we talk about impact, but the more realistic question should be when, where, how the oil spill happened. That can make a big difference. It's like a boxer the, punching the other, the partner, if you hit on top of the, the guard, you wouldn't make much impact. But if you hit on the jaw with the same force, you can knock him down. So depending on the condition of the ecosystem and nature, you can make a big difference in terms of the impact. So the bad answer is if that oil spill with the same amount happen in the wrong time, wrong place, in a wrong situation. It can be a catastrophic in at least local to regional scale. But for the basin scale, as we experienced from x stock blowout, we don't worry too much in that regard. Let me chime in, in on a different, uh, a different answer to the same question. What Professor Min just talked about was predicting the impacts or the effects of the spill. The, the second part, the, another way of looking at it is measuring the effects after they've occurred. And just to think about what that might entail, if you're just talking about the environmental effects, let's rule out human health impacts or economic impacts or whatever. Just think about environmental impacts. That's a, still a huge issue. And that's, that would require a lot of people a lot of scientists making a lot of measurements over a very large geographic scale as well as over a great depth. So you've got an enormous amount of samples to take. And then you have to analyze all those samples and then you have to get together and figure out what all of that means over this giant, giant scale. So of course what that means is there's a lot of money involved. And to its credit, BP has offered a lot of money to the scientific community. To, they're trying to do the right thing. We're having a very difficult time getting that money out to the scientists. So there's a lot of human impediments to getting the answer that you want, even when the money's there. Tracy? Lee, could you put up slide number 19, please? Uh, the question you ask is, is, is a very good one, and there may not be an answer because the system, the Gulf of Mexico is highly impacted, 
and there, this is a concept we call multiple stressors. There's all sorts of things going on, and during the spill, there were more things that happened. Um, there were massive releases of water from the Mississippi River, and that changed the ecosystem out there. So we're trying to sort out changes that might be relatively subtle on a moving carpet. And for example, uh, this is a slide. You see the flaming uh, wellhead there, the MC-252, you know, Deepwater Horizon. Can you use your pointer? Oh, uh, yeah. That's a good idea, Lee. Right there. Does anybody know what these little green dots are? Those are oil platforms, oil production facilities. So you're asking, and this is just a fraction, okay, just a subset of the Gulf. So you're asking, what is the effect of approximately 4 million barrels of oil that get released here, dispersed, um, maybe in a big plume down here? Well, we know a big plume down here. A lot of it went ashore. How do you separate that oil from the oil from all this other stuff? There are ways of doing it but it's really complicated. Um, and sometimes for things like methane, you may not be able to sort it out because the, the chemical characteristics you're looking for simply aren't there in methane. So the question is, um, is not answerable in many ways because we're not sure in many ways how we're gonna be able to do this. And as, as Lee pointed out, the longer it goes before we get a very um, comprehensive effort out there, the more difficult it will be. The, the, the body is going away. We're, we're losing the signal. And, and of course, in order to know the impact, you have to know what the circumstance was before the spill. That's correct. <laughs> and uh, we in the Gulf we of Mexico commonly call this the forgotten ocean yeah. <laughs> because we simply, uh, the, the Gulf has not received the level of funding that, say, the Atlantic and the Pacific coast of the United States have. So Dr. we have Thomas. much less information. Dr. Thomas? And another question is how long do we continue looking? So with the Exxon Valdez oil spill, um, they thought that the herring were doing quite well, but then they crashed four years later. They looked as if the population was doing well, and then they crashed four years later. There's, a lot, there's lots of possible reasons for that, but um, some of the more recent papers suggested it was related to the spill. And in fact, since that time, that population has not returned, has not rebounded. It rebounded a little bit, and then they opened the fishing. It crashed again. So um, you know you have to have, think of perhaps a much longer time scales when you want to look at long-term impacts. And this this is one complication. I've got the last slide of my talk. So I think it's uh, hmm? thirty-seven. That's one. So. Last year we talked about hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico and we had a lecture on that. And I study um, reproduction. And the whole of those areas where you saw those little green dots is also where there's very low oxygen in the, in the bottom waters. And it affects reproduction of the second largest um, species in terms of population, which is croaker. So here we have the oil spill is over this is close to the oil spill, but on the, on the shelf, in the shallower waters. And what we see here is the size of the ovaries is, um, is generally larger here than it is over in East Texas, where we have low oxygen. The point is, is in this particular case, we can't see any um, effect of oil on, on reproduction if there was any oil exposure there what we mainly see is another stress, low oxygen. So when you're looking for effects of oil, there's gonna be a lot of other things going on that um, are affecting the environment that can obscure trying to see these changes due to the oil spill. This is the same pattern, by the way, as we saw the year before the oil spill. So we had some data before, suggesting that for at least reproduction of fish on the shelf, this species, we didn't see any effects of the the amount of oil that actually reached um, the inshore there. All right, one more question on this segment, all the way in the back. How much sampling is taking place? Is it over the entire Gulf of Mexico or is it extending into the Atlantic? Anybody? Sampling the Well, no, th this, this study is to study the effects of the second largest low oxygen area in the world, which was just off that Mississippi Delta. 
There are studies up on the East Coast on croaker as well, particularly in Chesapeake Bay. So there's just studies done in different parts of the country on, uh, on, these, on these fish. All right, let's move on to another uh, video so that we can make some progress. This is the one for you. This is a, a, a short excerpt of a much longer video from the University of Georgia. Here, you know, natural seed, the crabs are orange, right? These are like brown. Their shells are brown and orange and look like they have like pustule things on them. They don't look, and we saw bunches of dead crabs. University of Georgia marine scientist, Dr. Samantha Joy, leads an international team of researchers on this four-week research cruise in the Gulf of Mexico. They study the continuing ecological impacts of the BP Deepwater Horizon oil disaster. Research crews from the Atlantis work around the clock. But the crew and the captain are just amazing and they make doing science so easy and you know, half of what we're able to accomplish out there, more than half, you know, we, we process the samples. It's the ship's captain and crew that provides us the samples to start with. And they just do an incredible job. Dr. Joy's research team works almost 24 seven analyzing water samples and sediment core samples retrieved from the sea floor. During this cruise, the researchers filter six and a half tons of seawater among other tests, they analyze the water samples for any signs of oil. The team collects 450 core samples during the cruise. 157 cores are from areas near the wellhead itself, and they process two tons of mud from the bottom. Dr. Joy reports the water samples now show few signs of oil. Near the wellhead, we saw little wisps here and there faint traces of, of oil and, and gas in the water, but nothing comparable to what we saw in, in May and June. And, and in, even in September, the concentrations were higher than we saw um, this, this go round. The cores collected on this cruise confirmed the presence of oil on the bottom. So we revisited two sites on this cruise that we revisited during the Oceanus cruise. And the this, this sam samples looked very similar. In fact, if you put one beside the other, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. They were, they were almost identical. So that was reassuring that we had confirmed that yes, you know, what we were seeing in, in September is in fact still there, maybe a little bit thicker. Dr. Joy is deeply concerned that cores near the wellhead exhibit heavy components, indicating a substantial amount of oil may have flowed from the broken head down into a canyon adjacent to the well. Avalanche was the word that one of the Alvin pilots used. It's just an avalanche coming down slope uh, from the wellhead. Dr. Joy believes cores and water samples cannot replace human direct inspection of the bottom. The crew prepares a dive on a naturally occurring seep on the Gulf floor near the wellhead to see how marine life there, accustomed to the natural environment of oil, have coped with not only that oil, but the sedimented oil from the blowout. Um, which is a site 10 nautical miles to the north of the wellhead. And the good aha moment was that we saw this cottage cheese oil layer that we'd seen before. Um, but I realized, you know, looking at it from a submersible, that if you didn't really know what you were looking at, it'd be really easy to think that it was just normal sediment. There's nothing, there's nothing that screams, this is oil on the bottom to you. It, it would be very easy just to take a, a camera and snap a picture of that and think that it was perfectly normal. Um, and, and that was just a, 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 a like a, Yikes, you know, I, I could see why if you're doing deep toe imaging that you could think that everything's perfectly normal because the other good aha was that there were, we saw fish, we saw eels, we saw organisms swimming around, we saw living inverts in the sediments right around the active seep. But you know, these, these are seep organisms. They're used to living at a seep. They're used to oil and gas fluxing by them all the time. Um, the bad aha moment was when we really started looking hard at some of the animals around the seep and we saw oiled corals, we saw oiled and dead corals, we saw oiled and dead sea fans and these sea, 
some of these organisms have commensal um, brittle stars that live on their on their 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 bodies and these organisms were dead but their brittle star commensals were still there which means they recently died otherwise the brittle stars would have you know gone away and looked for a better place to live um, all the filter feeding organisms were clearly impacted by the sedimented oil and these are filter feeding organisms you know a, a sea fan that's you know a few feet tall could be 500 years old um, so this is an organism that has been happily surviving at a natural hydrocarbon seep for 500 years and is now covered in brown slime and is dead. Um, so that, to me, was a very just sort of somber message that, you know, just because there are a lot of natural seeps in the Gulf of Mexico does not mean that oil on the bottom is, is going to be a non-issue because these organisms who filter feed and who are who are not selective filters feeders they're not going to spit the oil out they're going to just filter whatever comes past them um, they're they're being damaged dr joy's team discovers both healthy marine life and species impacted by the sedimented oil living around a naturally occurring oil seep 10 miles from ground zero when we return, the researchers prepare to dive on an area two miles from the wellhead. Right, so this is uh, referring to the, uh, the evidence that we did not see on the video of, uh, of oil close to the, the sea floor and what's the composition of that oil, what is it made up of, and so forth. Uh, well, I can start the simple answer. The, it's different from tar, obviously. That's a very heavy and, and very resilient stuff you can see on a, the surface beach. But on a, what you saw from the video is, as Samantha Joy mentioned, is kind of a fluffy thing mixed with the oil fine droplets with the, the naturally occurring the particulates. So they're settling down almost natural. So as she mentioned in the video, if you, are, you don't have a trained eyes, you may just see it as just natural sediments falling down on, on, on a sediment floor, but she could sample the core and saw it is really indeed oily. So it is a really fine particle that is spreading around. It's different from the very heavy, the crude, the tar type of more things. We hope. So, all right, let, let me ask something on that question. Uh, and I said uh, a couple of minutes ago, there, when the oil they're riding from the wellhead, they have a fractionation because they, you know they have different uh, different components, have different density. So what you see from the sediment, uh, deep sea sediment, that's kind of relatively heavy. So so if you think about the oil component, they uh, you know very complex mixture. There are uh, a lot of uh, component like alkene. The figure I showed you, there are a lot of. Uh, we call it polycyclic aromatic carbon. That's uh, most toxic, where, which Dr. Thomas showed you how the effect of the, we call the PAH the, on the different fish uh, and, the, and the, the animals. And that there are also some, uh, we call asphalt, you know, the stuff you make with the road. So uh, when the oil releases the environment, not only the density, but all the, you know, the de natural density fractionation, they stay in a certain layer, and then the light stuff, you go to the surface. But not only the density different, that also, also a liability difference. So different compounds, they, they can uh, be, be uh, chopped, up, chopped up by bacteria, or they chewed by bacteria at a different rate. So uh, for example, the, the N alkane, the long chain hydrocarbon I show you, that's probably one of the most labile component. So that's, it's not that toxic, and they can easily be taken up by bacteria. They can easily uh, you know, take them, taken up and they decompose by, uh, to CO2 and water, so it's not that toxic. The most toxic we care about is the pH in the long run, because those stuff, is, they can last really long. You know, they can last years or many years. If you go to the uh, Alaska, the, uh, the Exxon, uh, oil spill, you dig out the sediment, there are still a lot of pH component out there. So you're talking about the long-term effect. That's really the component you want to concern about. So then, and at one point, the, uh, the research I found that the oil uh, flow on the uh, sea surface, we call the oil, oil moles. So uh, my analysis show there that there's not a lot of pH there. 
So we know from the wellhead that the oil contains a lot of pH. So where the pH go? So one possibility is this pH, because of the fact that they, BP applied a lot of dispersant, they can dissolve in the water, the huge water body, you don't see them. The other uh, implication is a lot of heavy oil, like you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Mandy Joy show, observed the oil on the, uh, on the deep sea floor, they can contain a lot of pH compound, which, you know, based on the mass balance, when you don't see a lot of, on the sea surface, certainly a lot of still there. We know they are resistant. So that's one of the thing I'm thinking we should uh, kind of uh, make a priority to look at the, how toxic those deep, deep water sediments. The other thing, the deep sea, they're cold. You know, 4 degree, if you think about 1,000 meter deep. So if you put a bottle of oil in your fridge, you know it's going to last a really long time. So that's a similar thing. In the, when you go to the sea surface, high temperature, the microbial can work, they can work really hard. I mean, I have some data, uh, you know, I'm not going to show you because of time, they can degrade really fast, but the deep ocean, they're not. So it's high pressure and uh, also really cold. So that's the thing we should concern, especially in the long term. Yes, sir, in the back. I think the answer will speak for the question. <laughs> yeah, so the question, uh, to summarize, was about the sort of the, the, the geolog geologic formations and pressures that, uh, uh, that BP was, uh, was exploring for and plenty of other companies are there. Well, the first thing I could tell you is when you look at the video and you saw the rate uh, that was coming out the wellhead, you know why they were there, right? So, um, so that, that is over... So it's, it's deep enough that the, the, the pressure is quite high. Uh, it's very hard, as we've gone, uh, we've explored the, and gotten the easy stuff, you know, starting out in Beaumont, uh, but now going out into deep water, it's harder and harder to find. Uh, the geology is such that it's inter, interfingered layers of, there's lots of uh, sand is what you're actually producing out of, but uh, uh, they're le under, underlaying uh, large amounts of salt, which is very hard to see. But the, the weight of all that sediment in the Gulf of Mexico causes that overpressurized zone. And so it's, uh, you have lots of hydrocarbons that are there from the organic matter that, that matures under high pressure and temperature conditions due to due the depth of burial. And as we got in deeper and deeper water, they're under more and more pressure, and we're drilling deeper and deeper into the subsurface to get at this uh, um, oil and gas. So. Um, that's why it's so bloody expensive to do it, and the technology is, you know, is really incredible to actually get at uh, uh, some of those hydrocarbons. So fundamentally, the same thing that's happening in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, hydrocarbon energy companies are exploring off uh, the Niger Delta in Africa, uh, off in Indonesia. This is really the, 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 the pioneering forefront regions in, uh, in exploration today are these deep water frontier sites. And so the question then we have is, because we don't know a lot about them, because they really are frontiers, um, is that we they sort of get almost out ahead of some of the science that we know of. Uh, they really are, are exploring in that way. So it's a, um, it's a challenge for us to sort of help them uh, and the geologists who work for those companies to understand uh, fully all those formations and the, and the pressures that are there. But clearly, um, they were there for the right reason in terms of if you were an exploration company, um, you know, they found what they were looking for, and if it didn't spill, they were, they were going to make a lot of money off of it. Uh, um, so um, I don't know if that fully answered your question or not. Is there some consensus among scientists that it's unwise to drill in deep water? I, I would say that it's not a scientific question. No, truly, it's an economic question. I mean, they're out there to supply our need for oil and hydrocarbons, and it's worth their money. So somebody has to weigh, somebody, a population needs to weigh that against the population's sensitivity to environmental issues. How many people drove here? Yes, I was about to ask that question. How many of y'all drove here tonight? In my hybrid. <laughs> yes, sir. Briefly, what are the causes, uh, the biogeochemical causes of the oxygen depletion? 
it's almost 100% biological utilization. Dr. Liu, do you have something to add? If you go to uh, 21. Well, I think uh, Tracy already addressed for the, for the oil plume, if a deep, deep sea uh, oil plume, that's uh, oxygen deficit is 100% by the microbial. So here I show you another perspective. So if you look at the, you know, the oil film, if it, uh, oil film on the sea surface, on the sea surface here. Here is a, a normal sea surface here. And the oxygen actually, you can have do the photosynthesis, the algae can, uh, you know, can uh, synthesize organic matter and uh, a byproduct that release oxygen. And you also have the gas exchange between the air and the, and the water. So the physical process uh, can push the oxygen from the air to the water. But when you have an uh, oil film here, you can see the oil film, they can block the sunlight. So the algae cannot do the photosynthesis that efficiently. So you have less oxygen was produced. And certainly, we have organic layer, or like the oil, they can inhibit the gas exchange as well. So they can inhibit the, the physical process. So on the sea surface, a lot of has due to, uh, due to the uh, block the air sea exchange and also the photosynthesis. I can. OK, what I'm going to do is show you one more video, and we'll call it, a, call it quits for the night. This one is just a, a little bit of humor for you to enjoy. You may not have uh, known this, but uh, the Deepwater Horizon spill was not the only spill that uh, BP had. According to the charts, this is the best plan of action. Yeah, yeah. yeah great. Don't worry about it. It's, it's a small spill in a very large table. Sir, I think we're underestimating just how much coffee was spilled. Yeah, that's a lot of coffee. Well, we'd better hurry up because it's almost reached my laptop. Calm down, calm down. It's also going to destroy all the fish. Oh, boy. OK. Boom. Look at that. My god, it's encroaching on my map of Louisiana. OK. OK. Look. Oh, no. Fish. Laptop. Okay. Map. OK. I'm sorry. Fish. Fish. Oh, oh, no. Fish. Fish. Okay. Fish. 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 Wait. 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 I've got a brilliant idea. Jones, you gotta hurry up. I think the public is getting suspicious. Okay. All set. Damn. Didn't work. Oh, oh, oh my god, we are really screwed now. Look, garbage will fall into the coffee cups, stopping further spillage. Now there's just coffee and garbage. Wait, I've got an idea. Damn, I really thought that would work. Well, maybe it doesn't work right away. Let's observe it for three hours and then reassess it. Okay. We just wasted three hours. Damn it. Oh, that's everything I've got. God. The gentleman from uh, Halliburton here? Send him in. Gentlemen, we've. Oh my God. You guys are partly responsible for this. You provided these styrofoam cups knowing they were unstable. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't put this on us. You know what? Halliburton doesn't have to listen to this. We are out of here. Oh! oh. Thank you all for coming tonight, and let's thank our panel of scientists.